How many can say amen this morning? Good morning. Great to see you. Will you be seated? My name is Basilio. I get to be one of the pastors, and I want to just thank this wonderful worship team this morning. Can we give them a round of applause? God is good. You know, I also want to thank the team that showed up at 7 this morning to set up the system, the chairs. Thank you guys so much. I was able to come in a little later today and enjoy just being ready for the sermon. But welcome to Lighthouse, where we want to know Christ, make him known, where we love to make noise on the patio every Sunday morning at 8.45 a.m., amen, and at 10.30 a.m. Hey, just a couple of things for you, a couple of announcements. If you turn to the last sheet, guys, great to see you. Let's pray this morning. God, thank you for another day. Thank you for this month of October. Thank you for this first Sunday of the month. And Father, as we see this year fly by, help us just to hold on to you, Father God, in the midst of the situation, Father, with the pandemic, with divisions, with clashes. Father, we know that we can hold on to you, that our truth is found in you, our hope is found in you. And we come together this morning to worship you and say that we love you, that we honor you, and that we give you this time to celebrate your name and what you've done for us. Father, bless every person here, every visitor that is here for the first time just checking us out. Father, just would you be with them through this day, protect them and keep them. In God's name we pray and God's people said, amen. Amen. You know, we've been going through this series called Contrast, really through the books, uh, the epistles of, of John the Apostle. And, um, In the first part of his letter uh, that our other pastors have preached, John, I think, is presenting uh, to his listeners, to his followers, I would say a series of tests, of exams, of pop quizzes to show if they're really uh, followers of God. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Mike preached about walking in the light versus walking in the darkness. That's a test. The week after that, uh, the sermon was walking in love versus walking in hate. And then last week, Pastor Scott preached about loving the Father versus loving the world. And today in this passage, I want to talk about this contrast of knowing Christ versus denying Christ. Today, it seems as if the truth has been distorted. It seems that lies are given first place. It seems that what was right before is now wrong. What was wrong before is now considered right. You know, we're told crazy things like using violence instead of words is good. We're told that if a newborn, a pregnancy is inconvenient, that you get rid of it. We're told that God's definition of love doesn't fit anymore our immoral society's definition of love. But church, this morning as believers, we are called to know the truth, to know it without hesitation, without exception, because in times like these, The world needs the truth more than ever. Our country needs the truth more than ever. The world and this country need to know Christ, not deny him more than ever. And as Christians, we must step up and confirm that we know Christ. There is no gray area. We're either in or we're out. Amen? 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. I'm going to read it. This is the NIV version. And then we'll do a couple things. I don't want to take too long. I'm telling you, this passage is chock full of such richness. I'm going to touch on some things very generally because I think even every verse, you could preach a whole sermon on them individually. So here's my attempt to encourage and persuade you this morning. Verse 18. Dear children, this is John the Apostle speaking and writing. Dear dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Let's keep going. Verse 19, he says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, he says, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. How many can say amen to that? And he says, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. 
Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's kind of interesting. Verse 24, as for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us. What is it? Eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Last verse. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, it's not counterfeit, it's not fake, just as it has taught you, remain in him. That is God's word this morning. I want to give you a little bit of background of the Apostle John. I know that our pastors that have preached this series have talked a little bit about John. You know, when I start reading through the Bible and I read and, 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 and see these characters, I think, man, such heroes of the faith. And while I think they are heroes and were heroes of the faith, they were people just like you and I. Same troubles, same temptations, same misfortunes. They had to get up and work the next day. But you know what? We share in the same beautiful burden as them. We are called to preach the gospel, this hope we have in Jesus. And we are called to make disciples. And the Apostle John had this beautiful burden. Um, I like to read about John because he was actually uh, the younger brother of James. If you read the Bible, the Gospels, you'll see that John is mentioned after James, which is kind of an indication that he was younger than his brother. And their father's name was, do you remember? Zebedee. Anybody looking to name a child anytime soon? You might want to choose the name Zebedee or maybe Skippy. And the Apostle John, God used him in a mighty way. We know that he wrote these three uh, epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We know that he wrote a gospel named after himself. And we know that he was given the revelation, the book we know as the final book in our Bible. But if you remember where Jesus found James and John, they were fishermen. And he approaches them and he says, follow me and I will make you what? fishers of men. John was the baby of the group of apostles. He was probably a, a teen, in his late teens. He was probably in his early 20s. And so he was the baby of the group. And he was so privileged to be a part of the 12. He was actually part of Jesus's inner circle. He, his brother James and Peter were part of a, a more intimate group that Jesus had. So his relationship was so close to Jesus. And he was present during some amazing moments. The prayer at Gethsemane where Jesus was praying and he asked them, hey, keep watch. And they kept falling asleep and he said, hey, 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 wake up, keep watch. And he was present during the transfiguration where they saw Jesus just transfigured into this mighty and holy one. And perhaps another big privilege that John, baby John had when Jesus was on the cross, do you remember he turned to John and said, here's my, my mother Mary. She will now be your mother. Take care of her. And he turns to Mary and says, this is John. He will now take care of you. And the Bible says that John took care of Jesus' mother Mary for the rest of her life. And last but not least, as I talk about the Apostle John and just the amazingness in which God used him, he gave himself a nickname. You know what his nickname was? the disciple whom Jesus loves. Now that seems kind of self-serving, right? And John is the only one in his gospel that actually writes that about himself, that says, man, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. But I don't believe he did it out of pride. I don't believe he did it out of arrogance. I believe he did it because he so loved Jesus. You ever had a relationship like that? maybe with your spouse, maybe with a best friend, you love them, you know they have their back, that whatever happens, man, they're with you and you're with them. Uh, A couple days ago, I had the chance to go hang out with my best friend. Uh, My best friend is 61 years old. And approximately two weeks ago, he lost um, his fiance. She died suddenly. And the best thing I knew to do was just go spend time with him. Just be there. 
and let him talk or even be in silence. But I have such a relationship with him that I know that if something happens to me, he'll take care of me. If something happens to my wife, he'll take care of us. And I think that's how the Apostle John felt with Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. Four quick things. I want to go through this passage, kind of chew on it. We want to kind of unpack some main points. We're going to see how we can actually apply this to our lives. And the fourth thing we'll do is how we unleash this or share this with other people. Amen? Hey, if you have a pencil or a pen, write a few things. If you want to doodle to see what John looks like, go ahead and do that as well. But let's go through this passage. Write down this, uh, this main point I want to start out with. Knowing Christ will keep you rooted in the truth. Knowing Christ will keep you rooted in the truth. Denying him will keep you rooted in lies. Denying him will keep you rooted in lies. 1 John 2.18, John is saying, Dear children, who is he speaking to? Believers. Dear children. He says, this is the last hour. Notice this phrase, this is the last hour. It's going to repeat it twice. It says, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Now it's curious, why would he say this is the last hour twice? This is kind of based on this idea that when Christ, when the Messiah had come, uh, this new age had dawned. There was the era or the time before the Messiah and the time after the Messiah was to come. And so he's saying, man, this is the last hour. And in fact, Christians, believers at that time, thought that they were living in the, in the end of days, in the last days. And I think we believe that still. We're headed towards the end, the last hour. But how do we know what the last hour is? How do we know it's the end of days? Well, John answers it. He says, you know what? As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Anybody ever heard that word, Antichrist? Even now, many Antichrists have come. John is saying, this is how you know we're coming to the end. The Antichrist is coming, and many Antichrists have come. I think it's interesting that this word, Antichrist, the only place you find it is in John's writings. You don't find this word anywhere else, Antichrist. But the idea of the person, the idea of this mindset, of this concept of being against Christ or being a false Christ is as old as the prophet Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 2, read Daniel chapter 7. It talks about a leader, a man so vile, so evil, so blasphemous that he would curse God, that he would persecute the church, that he would be a false God. In fact, I think in history and even up to this final Antichrist, if you study the word, there will be a progression of antichrist. But there's also this mindset, this idea of being against Christ, of denying Christ, of just saying, yeah, he was a great man, he was a nice prophet, but he was not the son of God. And whoever tells you that Jesus is not the son of God, they are the antichrist. Again, I separate the person, the antichrist, who is who is uh, given power by the devil himself, but the attitude and the spirit of the Antichrist is all around us. How do I know? Look around us. In our culture today, in our society today. I was watching a, a, a TV. Uh, it's not a ministry. It's, it's really fake. Uh, locally here in Southern California, there's a man who dresses in all white, and he has uh, gatherings, and all the people are dressed in all white, and there are thousands of people in this auditorium. And he was reading this passage that I know you know well, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he turns to his congregation, and he says, I am that Word. I am Jesus. I'm back. And I could not help, and I was thinking, this is what John meant, antichrist someone who would speak against Jesus being the Son of God and someone who would take the place of the Son of God. Let's continue. John chapter 2, verse 19. It says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained in us, with us, but their going showed that none of them belong to us. In John's time, the devil was at work. In our time, the devil is at work. 
in John's time, there were false Christs, false prophets, false teachers infiltrating the first century church. And I believe it's happening today still. And John's saying, man, they were among us. But they left because they failed to draw people to their perverse lies and viewpoint. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about running the race as a follower of Jesus. Is it easy? It's challenging. But we have this hope that we do not race or walk alone. Somebody was telling me, I can't remember who it was recently, and they said, you know, the cool thing about running a race, the easiest part is always getting started and finishing. It's the middle part that's hard. It's the enduring part. And so endurance, endurance is key. And those who are not of Christ have no endurance. Those who are anti-Christ have no endurance. Here's main point number two. Knowing Christ means you have his spirit. Knowing Christ means you have his spirit. First John chapter 2, verse 20, he says, But you have an anointing, the Holy Spirit from the Holy One, from God himself, and all of you know the truth. This anointing, the Holy Spirit, the gospel message, this is our protection from the Antichrist and from the spirit of the Antichrist. Verse 21, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Do you realize how simple the gospel is? It's pretty simple. If you want to sum it up, let's use a verse, John 3, 16. God loves us so much. We're broken people. Let's turn to him. Let's turn from our ways and follow him. And you know what he'll give us? Eternal life. That's the simple gospel. Yes, there's more to it. But if you want to uh, simplify and sum up the gospel, that is it. (laughs) John is saying, you know what? I'm not teaching you anything new. I'm not teaching you something you don't know. Sunday after Sunday, we come here and it seems like we repeat the same thing. Do you know why? Because the gospel never changes. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Should you hear someone add or amend or try to uh, put their own spin on the gospel, they are an antichrist. They are against Christ. They are a false teacher and a false prophet, and they never knew Jesus. And some of you are like, man, you're mad this morning. No. I'm just telling you what John is saying, this test of knowing Christ and denying Christ. Um, (laughs) When I was in college, I went to music school. So you get to meet all these people from around the world. And I was in a band, um, and there was this guy who played uh, guitar, and he'd grown up in the church. And he says, you know, man, I love that we can have spiritual conversations. He said, but I'm learning something new in my faith. I said, really? Really? I said, tell me, what are, you, what are you learning? And he gives me this book, and he says, you know, I'm learning to be a Christian Buddhist. He says, Rick, check out this book. Tell me what you think. And I love to read. So I'm reading the book, and then I'm starting to make notes, and, you know, I, I, I write my own commentary in it, and I give it back to him, and he says, man, why did you write in my book? I said, because your book is a pack of lies. I said, the gospel doesn't need any addition. I said the gospel is simple. And friends, we have God's spirit. Knowing Christ means we have his spirit. We could differentiate between what is his and what is not his. Amen? I watched a lot of cooking shows. Is that bad? And my favorite cut of meat is a brisket. And it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful meat, piece of meat. And, and I'm watching shows and I'm seeing all these recipes. And, and you know, you really have to try hard to mess up a brisket. And in these shows, I get so kind of flustered and kind of like, I'm like, why, do, why are they messing up this piece of meat? Do you know that cooking a brisket is super simple as far as spices? I see these people throwing all these things on it, fruit, injecting it. God knows what else they do. So, I don't know what they do, and it's really infuriating. You know, all you need to make a good brisket as far as spices are two things. You ready? Salt and pepper. You said it. Salt and pepper. Man, why mess up a brisket? Friends, why mess up the gospel? 
It's that simple. Hey, let's, let's continue. This third point, this third main point. Knowing Christ means you know the Father. Knowing Christ means you know the Father. Here's John talking and saying, who is the liar? <laughs> it is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. Wasn't Jesus himself the one that said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen? Amen. It is only by Jesus. If you have Christ, if you know Christ, you have the Father. If you deny Christ, you do not have the Father. We talked about Jesus being known as a good man, as a miracle worker, as a healer, as a prophet, and some other belief systems. Friends, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the only way to the Father. So here's my question to you this morning, among a few questions I have. Should you confront someone who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Absolutely. In love, with love and mercy, you say, hey, you know what? That's a lie. What you're teaching is not true. And the Bible says, have nothing to do with them. If they are rejecting Jesus, say, hey, you know what? God bless you. I'll see you on the, on the other side. Verse 23, let's continue. First John chapter 2. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Bottom line, you acknowledge the Father. You must also acknowledge His Son. You know, we do some really wonderful things here at Lighthouse Christian Church. When somebody wants to join our church, uh, when they want to get baptized, they come forward at the end of the sermon, uh, sermon during the response time. And they're usually asked to make a public confession. And that's a good way of knowing if people know Christ. And it'll go something like this. For example, if I came forward, they'd say, Basilio, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? They say a few other things, but that's essentially it. And my hope is that they always say, yes. Friends, only by the Son can we have access to the Father. Verse 24, he says, As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, and if it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. Church, the original message, the gospel, that's what counts. It's our first safeguard against lies. If you don't know your Bible, if you don't know the gospel, man, I want to encourage you, dig into it, ask questions about it. But don't be caught off guard. Again, when I was in college, they asked me to, if I wanted to be a Christian Buddhist. There was also a girl who was on the streets preaching. And she was saying, you know, the, the Bible talks about God being the father of all things. So doesn't that make creation Mother Earth? And I said, what? Yeah, it makes sense. Father God and Mother Earth. I said, no, you're a liar. I would, have been, I would have never been able to say that if I didn't know my Bible. So what if they were to ask you that question? Do you know how to respond? Do you know your Bible? Do you know the gospel? Here's the last point. Knowing Christ leads to eternal life. Knowing Christ leads to eternal life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. <laughs> John's telling his followers... And this is what he promised us, eternal life. That's the gift. We can't earn it. We, can't, we don't deserve it. Eternal life. Um, <laughs> I pick on my father because he's such an unusual guy. Um, I love my father. You know, growing up, he, he was my hero. And, you know, fathers, they're kind of crazy. And I say that with love. They think they can do anything and everything. You know, at one time he thought he was a barber and messed up our hair. You know, one time he thought that uh, he could show us how to shave and he didn't even know how to shave. You know, at one time he taught us to cook and man, we almost got food poisoning. I love my father. And there were times I remember, uh, my father works in concrete and construction. He would take us to work. We would work concrete with him since we were seven, eight years old in the Texas heat, pouring concrete, whatever it was, rock work. And we would work so hard, but he would say, guys, work, and at the end, I'm going to take you to McDonald's. And that gave us an incentive to work, you know. 
I think I was seven, my brother was eight, and the other one was nine, and we would work, and we did that all our lives. And I remember this particular time he said, I'm going to take you guys to McDonald's. Well, we worked from six in the morning to about eight in the evening, and it was time to pack up. And man, we were tired. We were tired. He didn't pay us, right? We were free labor. And we were saying, man, it's time for McDonald's. And you know what? He forgot. So we went on strike. I use that weird illustration to say, man, what would the point be of following Jesus if there was no end result, if there was nothing to look forward to? Friends, this world is temporary. This is going to pass. But eternal life starts the moment that you believe in Jesus, that you turn from your ways. From that moment on is when your life, your real life starts. You go from simply existing to living. Verse 26 and 27, let me finish up this morning like this. He says, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. I wish I could go more into what the Antichrist is, prophecies, all that kind of stuff, but we don't have a lot of time. But I want to say this. He's saying Antichrist, false prophets, false teachers, these liars will do all they can to tear up the church, to deceive the church, to keep the church from meeting, from worshiping the one true God. The devil himself is the primary deceiver. In fact, John 8, 44 calls the devil the father of all lies. If you encounter the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, you know the power behind him is the devil. Verse 27, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, this gospel, this spirit, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Friends, we have an insurance policy. It's called the Holy Spirit. We're not in this alone. God walks with us. We talked about the first safeguard against lies being the gospel message, the original message, untainted I would say the second safeguard against lies is God's spirit encouraging us, building us up, revealing what his word means to us. So I kind of unpacked this this message briefly. We kind of saw some main points. What does this have to do with me? How do I respond? How do I actually apply this to my life? Here's a couple things you can write down as we finish this morning. We look at this contrast, knowing Christ and denying him. I want to encourage you, know Christ, and pursue him daily. Not just Sunday mornings. Not just Tuesday afternoons or Wednesday afternoons or Thursday afternoons when we have our students or young adults or Facebook Live. But to know Christ, you have to know him and pursue him daily. And I'll tell you, now in our society, in our culture, in our time today, now is not the time to try to do things of our own accord or by our own worldly wisdom, as Pastor Scott preached last Sunday. Bottom line, friends, man is broken, we are corrupt, we are selfish, we are arrogant, and we are in need of God's love. There's hope. It's not all bad. There's hope. We've turned away from him in our country. We've abandoned our moral compass. The spirit of the Antichrist does not want God in the equation in our country, in our lives, in our family. But I would encourage you, as you know Christ and pursue him daily, put God back into your equation every day and in everything. Amen? Amen. The second thing you can do to apply this is know Christ and find community with other believers. Our faith needs constant testing. There needs to be transparency. There needs to be accountability. It's about doing life on life with others. How? By sacrificially giving your life in service to others. The Bible says that by this they will know that they are my disciples if they love each other. I would encourage you, use your time, use your resources, use your skills, use your gifts to help someone else. And then how do we actually share this with somebody else? I would say this, know Christ and share his truth with those who need hope. You know, a lot of people, I think, (laughs) this is actually funny, including myself, a lot of people have gained weight during this pandemic situation. 
But I, that could also be discouraging and depressing. This time has been so awkward and so weird. And we're seeing such conflict and such division and such hate. Friends, now is the time to share this gospel of hope with those who need to hear it. Now is the time to get our feet dirty, not to hide behind the four walls of a building or stay stuck on a hill in Oceanside. Now is the time to get our hands wet. I would say less words and more action. And how can you do that? Well, find someone in your sphere of influence that you need to share Christ's truth with today. I mean, if you really want to know Christ, really know him and show it. If it's a family member, a co-worker, a distant relative, somebody, you know what, it starts at home, then your neighborhood, then around the world. Know Christ and share his truth with those who need hope. I would say ask God to help you see others as he sees us as well. We're not better than other people. We just have this amazing hope in Christ Jesus. I think Pastor God said it, Pastor Scott said it well last week. He said, man, God is so stinking awesome. And what a privilege to know him. Better yet, you know, I would ask you this morning as we close, man, give, give him your life. Come and know him. Don't live a life of denial. Give him your, your time, your goals, your dreams. Man, come join our church. Come experience the waters of baptism. And as we get ready for this next song, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I want to meet you up front as we sing this next song. If you need prayer, you're saying, man, I really want to make my faith real. I really want to know Christ. I don't want to deny him. I want to meet with you up front. I want to pray with you. I want to make a public confession with you as our team comes up and as we sing this next song. Team Kono up here. Yeah.